Here on the Snake River in eastern Washington, a dam is being built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Lower Granite Dam, original estimated cost $82 million, present estimated cost $269 million. Estimated completion date, 1975. It is the last in a series of dams bringing slack water all the way back to the city of Lewiston, Idaho, 450 miles from the Pacific Ocean. When it's completed, uh, we'll achieve uh, the dream of finally making uh, Lewiston the port for the state of Idaho, which never before had navigation water of any quantity to be able to move its products in and out of Lewiston. Quite clearly, the nation would be better off if we didn't build the, build the lower granite project. I think, it, I think it'd be a good thing for Lewiston. We hope that we can get an injunction completely stopping any further construction on Lower Granite Dam. Well, we're very excited about the Lower Granite Dam. The Corps engineers, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. And I don't think, I think people can sit up and jump up and down and scream and yell and holler. They're, they're going to do what they want to do. Seaway, America's largest construction firm employing 40,000 people, mostly civilians. Long a public hero, now increasingly denounced as a villain. What is the Corps today? Is it, as critics charge, a runaway bureaucracy, actively seeking projects such as lower granite, by deliberately exaggerating their benefits and underestimating their costs, aided by businessmen who will profit from the projects? Or is it, as it claims, only a public servant carrying out its orders? In the opinion of Dr. Gardner Brown, a specialist in river basin economics at the University of Washington, all studies by political scientists show that the Corps of Army Engineers is an extraordinarily adroit um, agency for um, uh, marshalling local support for its projects, which are not necessarily um, uh, projects that are in the interest of the local people. This is denied by Colonel Richard M. Connell, head of the Corps' Walla Walla District and the man in charge of Lower Granite. The Corps is not in the business of promoting. But where it becomes obvious that for the economic, social uh, improvement of the area, that a particular project would be of benefit to the whole of the area, we make such information available to the local citizens. You then raise the philosophical question, is that promotion or is that simply doing a public service? Conservationists in the area call the dam a tragedy. They also claim that their opposition is not merely a matter of sentimentality, but is based on solid economic facts. The cost analysis studies justifying lower granite completely ignore the value in dollars of the wildlife being destroyed, they state. If these figures were included in the cost of the dam, the price the taxpayers are really going to pay for the dam would be revealed as higher than the benefits the dam will produce. And thus, lower granite actually is a liability to the country instead of an asset. These wildlife losses and the Corps' reaction to the charges are outlined by two officials of the Washington Game and Wildlife Department at Walla Walla, Jack Kirkendall, department head, and Wendell Oliver, a biologist. The hunting and fishing revenues, uh, based on the resources that, that uh, were supplied by the Snake River in its natural state, uh, over the 100-year life of the project, would amount to in excess of $150 million. Will this be lost? And this will all be lost for the future if uh, some means of mitigation is not uh, performed. And uh, at the present time, uh, the mitigative efforts uh, look rather futile in this respect. Do you consult with the wildlife people when you're involved in these sort of projects? Well, we have been continuously over the years. Long before this district was formed, there's been a continuous uh, interchange uh, between the Corps activities and the Fish and Wildlife people. Mm -hmm. Well, we have met with the Corps now since I've been here some 11 years. And the relationship has always been on a friendly, receptive basis. We'll go out and exchange thoughts and ideas. 
But that's as far as it goes. If we submit a report or, or any kind of an information to them, it is not utilized. We keep arguing that wildlife is lost. They will say wildlife cannot be lost because when you flood an area, they'll merely move up the hillside. This does not happen, and I don't know whether we'll ever be able to convince them that animals just cannot exist on grass alone or dirt or some other type of forage. What does support most of the animal life in a river valley is a narrow but crucially important band of bush, trees, and marshes along the river edges. Over the centuries, earth washed down the hillsides creates what is called the riparian strip, and its thick cover feeds and shelters the animals which roam the hills on either side. In the summer, game birds come down for the insects and shade. In the winter, the deer and elk leave the frozen highlands for the river bottom, where the temperature is milder and food still available. And this is what it is like after a dam is built. These are reservoirs already on the Snake River. Kirkendall comments. Sloping hillsides, rock revetments. You're seeing uh, vegetation that once was lush and productive, completely eradicated. All we get back is scrap pack type of fish, and we definitely will lose all of our wildlife. Mm -hmm. And we, when we talk about wildlife, we should clear this up too. This is all bird life, all animal life, not just some species. This is your songbirds. This is all types of insect life. This is all types of wildlife of any nature. This family lives by a dam reservoir 500 miles farther up the Snake River. Here, during a period of low water level, Ed Holland, a forestry worker with his wife Carmelita and their son Brian, walk along what was once the riparian strip. The Hollands admit they welcomed the Idaho Power Company's announcement it was building the dam. The dam has been finished 11 years now, and the Hollands have long since become disillusioned with the changes brought about by the reservoir. Well, we had a beautiful old river here before, and... Uh, we had all kinds of game feed along the banks here, and we had fish that we haven't got now, steelhead, salmon, and sturgeon. Was it um, nicer here before, I and mean, what did you have? Oh, yeah, sandbars well, and... There was a lot of willows lying in the banks, both banks, and that was uh, our winter game feed. Uh, Mostly. Was there much to do? Yeah. Could you, could you boat? And there was some fair-sized trees along the banks and little shade. Now there is absolutely no shade down here. It's just barren and it's miserable. It's so hot in the summer there's no protection at all from the hot sun glistening off all this water. The Corps contends a reservoir increases recreation oh, in an you. area and has predicted a gain in recreation for the lower granite area worth $240,000 a year. Well, I think the aspect of uh, recreation that's more significant than others is the fact that we've changed from the, the fishermen who went out and spent all day uh, wandering up and down the river or drifting or perhaps even standing along the stream to more family-related activities as a whole where they go out for the day and camp out at the, one of the small county or state parks or other campsites. Uh, and as a sense, that in that sense, it is a, a different sort of water-related activity. The Hollands also expected a recreation boom on their new reservoir. It never materialized. There's not very many people that use this reservoir. The power company claims there's 250,000 a year, but there is not. You, you can drive this 45 miles up and down this reservoir any day of the week and never meet another car. And you can go to any of these big parks any day in the summer and even sometimes on uh, holidays like uh, 4th of July and you can't find over a dozen campers in some of these big parks and they are expensive parks, all modern, big lawns. And there just isn't anybody interested enough to, on um, these type of uh, reservoirs in the snake, to come and uh, 
stay here. There's nothing for them. The fishing is poor around the park. Yes, what about all of the uh, animals? Well, we've lost them. Uh, we've just lost all of the animals. We've lost several thousand deer and, yeah, and uh, all of our geese, all of our ducks. This particular place right here used to be one of our favorite goose hunting places, and yeah. you can see no geese or ducks either one here now. There, there's nothing for... Right here at this rock is where we used to set up to shoot geese. There's nothing for the geese or ducks either one to feed on, on these dry hillsides when your water is halfway up the sagebrush hill. That, there's just nothing for them, and they just don't like it. They never will come back in here. One thing the Corps has done for wildlife is build a large and modern fish hatchery for the Lewiston area's famed steelhead trout. Although the Corps points to the hatchery as an example of how technology can compensate for wildlife losses, the hatchery's results last year served inadvertently to point up another problem caused by dams. Nitrogen poisoning. As water pours over a dam, it frequently becomes saturated with nitrogen, which kills fish. The baby fish released last year from the new hatchery had six dams to traverse on their way to the ocean. Stuart Morrell, an officer with the Idaho Fish and Game Department in Lewiston, explains what happened. It uh, was uh, built to certainly to replace the runs that were lost up the North Fork of the Clearwater when Dwarshack Dam was built. This last year, they uh, released uh, 1,400,000 uh, smolts, or the little downstream migrants. This was their first year that they uh, let them go. And the studies downriver by the um, Bureau of Commercial Fisheries have indicated that they lost about 90% of these fish before they reached the uh, ocean because of uh, nitrogen gas bubble disease, primarily uh, caused by dams. But will these losses not be outweighed by the benefits of the dam? Deep water barges, which now ply the lower snake, will be able to come all the way up to Lewiston and transport Idaho's products to the coast. Colonel Connell elaborates. Well, uh, quite obviously, this is wheat country, particularly uh, all along this part of the Snake River, and wheat will be uh, one big product. Uh, since we're getting all the way to Lewiston, we're getting very close into the lumber areas, and there will be considerable amount of lumber being transported by barge on the river. In addition, of course, there will be petroleum products uh, being moved upriver uh, and likely chemicals as well, uh, either fertilizers and or other products in and out as the need indicates at the time. The Corps backs up these claims as it does on each of its projects with a massive collection of statistics, charts, and studies showing the benefits in dollars of any project it is undertaking are greater than its cost. The sheer size of such studies ordinarily discourages any in-depth examination of these claims. Critics say the figures in the studies are padded to enhance projects. Recently, a number of economists, including Dr. Brown, have become skeptical of the core studies justifying lower granite. For almost a year, Dr. Brown and some of his students have delved into them. In undertaking any kind of uh, revised evaluation of a public project, uh, what's important is to identify the, the, the most salient benefit categories and the most important cost categories and have a look at the basis for their estimates. And um, in just looking at um, petroleum and wheat and um, grain shipments, for example, there are many other commodities, and in some of the cost categories, and notably um, flood control, um, it's possible to, um, to, to, to seriously question, in fact, um, show that the benefit cost, that, that the lower granite project is not feasible. And since we Dr. Brown explained what he discovered that led him to believe this. It seems to me that the petroleum tonnage shipments um, have been seriously overestimated. Uh, it seems to me that um, the grain shipments have been overestimated and the savings per ton of wheat ship have been overestimated. Pulp and paper, in turn, has been overestimated in its tonnage ship. Consider petroleum. During, uh, during the 11 year period 1952 to 1963, uh, petroleum tonnage was, the, the petroleum tonnage estimates were doubled. Um, why is that? It's, it's hard to know. The Corps doesn't say. And um, 
meanwhile, on the lower Columbia, um, shipments of petroleum fell by a factor of three. Um, and this was largely because um, of rival modes of transportation, in particular some new pipelines were constructed. So, mm. so we, have, um, we have the core doubling um, estimated tonnage of petroleum shipped in, during an 11-year period, while we're observing on the, on the contiguous stream bed a, uh, a rapid decline in petroleum yeah. shipments due to um, this uh, pipeline activity. Mm -hmm. Only by the tedious process of examining each product in this manner is it possible to check if these accusations about the Corps' calculations have any validity. The barging of wood products is another major benefit listed by the Corps in its calculations. This is where the products would come from. Potlatch Forests Incorporated, the one large mill on the lower granite pool. PFI is Lewiston's single biggest employer. More than 2,000 people work here, producing lumber, paper, wood pulp, and similar products. At present, everything is shipped out by rail. We asked Colonel Connell how many tons the Corps estimated could be switched to cheaper barge transportation, the estimates used in calculating the benefits of lower granite. To get PFI's own estimates, we talked to Ken Hinkle, the mill's traffic manager, and a staunch supporter of the dam. Their answers differed considerably. In the paper, we visualized something just short of 100,000 tons. Uh, sawdust, chips, and plywood, something a little over 100,000. A wood pulp and its products about 150,000. I think the largest uh, volume of uh, tonnage susceptible to barge would be our wood pulp, 30 to 40,000 tons a year. These studies were done some time ago, as I mentioned, and therefore we feel that likely uh, they are on the low side of anything. I see. Economists claim to have found similar discrepancies in every product listed. Dr. Walter Butcher, a specialist in agricultural economics at Washington State University, had investigated the Corps' grain barging estimates. The Corps' analysis of uh, navigation benefits for moving grain seemed to be rather high or generously estimated in the first place in those areas that uh, already have navigation service. Uh, grain continues to move out by rail, even though the navigation is present and only about half of it goes out by navigation. Uh, the Corps, in their analysis of the lower granite area, said uh, all the grain, or virtually all, would go out in barges. Uh, the second thing is but the greatest benefits will be supplied by a very different product. Power. Power for the growing cities and industries of the Northwest. This need for power is the argument used most often when defending the need for lower granite. In the next 20 years, the Northwest will need another 37 million kilowatts of electricity. Lower granite will initially supply 410,000 kilowatts, a bit over 1% of this. Eventually, its output will be doubled to slightly over 2%. The, the major uh, benefit that will come from the lower granite dam is the power. This is the major economic benefit. And uh, uh, there will be uh, power produced there uh, relatively efficiently, but over the long run, uh, the projected increases in power demands in the Northwest are uh, so great that whether we have lower granite dam or not is going to make a very small difference in the amount of additional thermal uh, produced power that we'll have to have. We're about out of hydro opportunities and, and we're going to have to go to thermal plants and lower granite, whether we have it or not, is not going to make very much difference in the, in the number of those thermal plants that we have. Not only are the lower granite benefits exaggerated, the critics claim, but the official cost of building the dam has been disguised. The cost of the millions of dollars to be used to pay for dam construction is calculated at three and one-eighth percent interest, although the actual interest paid will probably be over twice as high. This alone, ignoring everything else, would make the cost of the dam higher than its benefits, they claim. The Lower Granite Project is going to be built using 3% money. Every economist that I know of uh, would recommend using an 8% rate of interest or more. At 8%, this project is not feasible from an economic point of view. How do they get this 3%? The choice of a 3% is a uh, policy decision made by the Water Resources Council the Water Resources Council is, in fact, composed of the Corps of Army Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the other dam builders. They, they make their own policy.
They make their own interest rate? They make their own interest rate. They tell you, what can we do? It's the, it's the Water Resource Council that dictates the policy, but they, in fact, are the Water Resources Council. Isn't that incredible? That really is incredible. Dam work goes ahead. But who is right, the Corps or its critics? Certainly in the minds of some people at least, there are grave questions about lower granite's feasibility. Were these questions asked and answered before the dam was approved? Well, on any of the Corps projects, uh, one of the things that happens is that there's an, a sincere effort to obtain the views of all of the people and local interests. And uh, their views and the expressions of uh, local elected representatives as well as the people themselves are recorded in a report which is forwarded to the Congress mm -hmm. along with the governor's recommendation. Mm -hmm. And this was done in the Lower Granite? This was done in Lower Granite and all of the projects that I am aware of uh, in uh, the last 50 years, I would guess, of, of the Corps. Don Thomas, former head of the Lewiston Chamber of Commerce's Conservation Committee, and a resident of the city for 30 years, disputes this claim. Uh, actually, there's only been one public hearing. And uh, all of the times that they have, uh, they have been in here, they have visited with the uh, city engineers, they've been visited with the commissioners, or they've been visited with the people in the port district, but these are not really what I would call bona fide public hearings. There's only been once when the public has actually had an opportunity to meet with them in a group situation. and. Uh, and question them. Uh, this was after the dam was um, authorized, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the dam actually was authorized some 25 years ago. I doubt if there is a person in the, in the area here that had any say at all on the authorization of the dam. Where does the big push come from? Economist Butcher worked in Washington, D.C. for the Secretary of the Army as a systems analyst monitoring core uh, activities. No, Here is how he found projects were promoted. Any, any project that the Corps has is going to benefit somebody directly, some small group or some important business, and uh, uh, they can, they'll take over and the Corps can give them information and they'll take over usually and, and uh, provide the push to get the, the uh, political uh, muscle behind the project because they, that is the group or the, or the uh, company or whatever it is, is going to really benefit from the project. Carl Moore of Lewiston is chairman of the board of the Inland Empire Waterways Association, which has members from four states. And he candidly agrees his group promoted the series of dams on the Snake River. Oh, you never would have built any one of them without a considerable degree of, uh, of pressure having been applied. Uh, of course, this happened a long time ago on these projects. The lobbying that's going on now is on other projects. The, the strongest lobby group uh, by far is the navigation group and the waterways development uh, groups. Uh, they really have a uh, very strong lobby in Congress and they're very close to the committees that make the appropriations and approve the, the projects. Do you uh, see examples of this? In well, yeah, I think one of the, uh, one of the most interesting examples of it or incident, incidents uh, regarding this is uh, the top member of the professional staff of the Senate Appropriation Committee uh, works and ghosts a lot of articles for a, uh, a criteria newsletter that's put out by uh, a waterways uh, uh, lobby or waterways development type of, uh, of group. Mm -hmm. So he's working on the one hand with the committee that's uh, setting standards and appropriating money for projects. On the other hand, he's trying to uh, help this group that's trying to get pro uh, projects built. So this is a very close, uh, very close relationship. Anti-dam action is being taken. A conservation group, the Northwest Steelheaders, has been working since late 1969 to get a court injunction halting lower granite so the project can be reevaluated using up-to-date studies. They feel confident that an impartial study would show lower granite is a mistake. One of the group's attorneys is Larry Smith. As it's been in the past, why uh, the only consideration given to dam building is how much electric power you're going to get and how much money that electric power will make. And uh, that's the only uh, real benefit that anybody uh, talked about. And as far as any detriments there might be, these were 
really ignored up until now, but we've run out of rivers. The Corps is opposed to any re-examination of the dam's feasibility, and fighting the Corps of Engineers can be a frustrating experience, Smith has learned. The more dam that they can build, and the more money that they can spend, uh, then they'll be in a position to go to court and say, well, uh, you can't stop us now because we've done this much already, and uh, this much money has been spent. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we feel that even if the purposes of the dam uh, might not be approved on today's standards, nevertheless, we should go forward to this project. So it's to their advantage to drag their feet as much as they can, and uh, the Corps itself, uh, as far as supplying documents to us, uh, they've been uncooperative and they have dragged their feet. The Waterways Association disapproves of the conservationists' action. They're 20 years late. Uh, if, uh, if they had moved 20 years ago, it may have been timely, but they're far, far beyond a timely action. I don't think they'll be successful as a personal uh, uh, view of the thing. I doubt that they'll be successful, but the fact is that in a, in a timely manner, this may have been something that should have been considered. Dams have become controversial today. Lower granite is only one of the fights the increasingly embattled Corps is facing across the nation. It's a disturbing change for an agency so long accustomed to public admiration. Do you think these attacks on the Corps are unjustified? Well, I think there are those that tend to go overboard or would turn the clock back. But every time man steps foot in the forest or attempts to take water from the stream, he changes somehow his own environment. And our purpose here is to achieve the best for man as a whole, and not simply to turn the clock back or wish that things were like they were in the days of our great-grandfather. In that view, yes, I think some of the things are completely unjust. The war used to, to write its own ticket for years and years and years, and, um, and project after project after project is being stopped because the public is, is rising up and saying, no, no, we don't want the Cross Florida Barge Canal, no, we don't want the Dos Rios Project, no, we don't want the Snoqualmie River Basin Project, no, we don't want um, Hudson River Improvement, that's not improvement. And um, um, they, have to, they have to change their tactics um, if, they're going to, if they're going to survive. Lower granite continues to rise, and the controversy keeps pace. Some of the conservationists believe they still have a good chance to stop the dam, but their numbers are dwindling as the dam grows. More than three years of construction remain, and during that time, one thing at least is certain. Controversy will continue to hover over the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and over the lower granite dam, now rising on the Snake River.